I think that the the company today is probably the most undervalued tech platform on earth, right? And sort of the the macro backdrop before we we um, get into BlackBerry deeper is what's happening with data now in this decade and what's going to happen in the next few decades is very much unprecedented. We're generating so much data. I think um, last year it was something like it was more than forty or fifty setabytes, which is just an immense amount, right? And that has sort of given way to the rise of semiconductors and very spectacularly so, right? AMD, NVIDIA, companies like that, the stock has been through the roof in the past couple of years and it seems unstoppable. And what I think is going to happen with data next is basically everything is going to be software defined and data driven, right? Industry in general is full of um, isolated, disconnected uh, hardware devices doing things for us, right? And these data is actually, if connected, and if they had some software embedded, could be data generation machines, which we can then use to process that data and obtain insights that would radically increase our efficiency in terms of doing stuff across the board, right? So this, this is, I think, where BlackBerry fits in. This is the future. And BlackBerry has two key offerings. Uh, one of them is IoT, and the other one is cybersecurity. And actually, when I talk about BlackBerry having a much potential higher return than 10x or, or whatever uh, in the next 5, 10, 15 years, I tend to think a lot about IoT. And here's why. Because today, um, BlackBerry's RTOS, real-time operating system, which is called QNX, is installed in 195 million cars on the road, right? So that's something like 10, 12% of cars currently on the road today are running a uh, BlackBerry software, right? So, so what is an RTOS? An RTOS real-time operating system is an operating system that um, guarantees it will run properly when it has to. It's the kind of operating system you run on devices that when they don't run properly, things go very wrong. So you think about cars, medical devices, spaceships, planes, by the way, uh, SpaceX runs QNX as well, incidentally. Okay, right, so, so the, the bottom line uh, about BlackBerry seen from the IoT perspective is Netflix has 220 something million subscribers today, right? And the company is valued at 158 billion. Now, BlackBerry is installed in 195 million cars, whilst the company today is valued at something like 3.7 billion, I think, as we speak. So, in essence, as cars become connected, um, we should see BlackBerry do very well in the future. As it refers to the innovation stack, obviously no one has been able to make an RTOS that's better than QNX per the signals that we see in the market. Recently, they closed a deal with BMW. Again, they have 24 out of 20, 25 EV OEMs. They, they have a focus in this space, which is unmatched. And the thing is that no one is really looking at this space yet. There's no hype about it. Um, you don't hear about other companies that are trying to get into this space. So they've silently built a moat in a space that's going to turn into a very relevant one, probably as relevant as semiconductors today, but no one's paying attention. And then going back to if I, if I see, um, I, I believe you asked if I see a way of uh, BlackBerry competing in its own kind of space, right? Yeah. You asked that. The thing with BlackBerry is you have, um, other players that are pure cybersecurity players, and they just do cybersecurity. They prevent threats. But it's the combination of IoT and cybersecurity that makes BlackBerry unique. Because if we think about what the future is likely to look like, it's, again, as I said, things connected to the internet, producing data, sharing it, receiving data to operate based on insights and so forth. So it's the combination of the two. And to be specific, the combination of real-time operating systems and unified endpoint management that makes BlackBerry unique. I, there's no single company that has a combination of the two. And um, if my understanding of the future is correct, then I think that will make BlackBerry very successful and it will kind of have it operating in its own field. And so when you say they, you know, BlackBerry has won the trust, is that a result of just years of it taking to develop this as well as they know what they're getting, whereas a, a new, you know, if Amazon tries to do their own, they're, they're unproven um, and people will be less willing to switch over. To be honest, I don't know what it's a result of because I haven't been inside the company. And as, as is the case, pretty much always, I have to operate with market signals. 
that we see. But I don't know how they've done it, but to me, it's phenomenal because really the connected car is the future of the car. And if, if you look at it, I mean, the, the only way that can happen is through an outsource. So I don't know how they've done it, but it's really such a strong mode that's so overlooked. And um, the trust is palpably there. That's why Amazon closed the deal with them. Otherwise, Amazon would just go straight ahead into it themselves. But you can't because you need the trust. Right. And then the other thing, interesting there, you had mentioned uh, the innovation stack theory. Could you maybe just briefly summarize what that means? And it was the Square co-founder, I think, who uh, originally came up with it? Yeah. So the innovation stack is a theory or a term that was coined by, I'm looking up the name of, of the gentleman because I keep forgetting it. I think it's time that I quote him properly. <laughs> by Tim McKelvey, Square now called Block co-founder. And um, the theory is the way he explained why Amazon was not able to beat Square at their point of sale business in 2014. So in 2014, Amazon said, we're going to go take on Square. We're going to take their merchants away from them. And they went ahead full on. And until then, Amazon's kill rate was 100% when they were able to A, match the service you were offering, B, underprice it. And then by the end of 2014, early 2015, if I'm not mistaken, Amazon sent square point of sale devices to all of their customers as a, you know, kind of recognizing defeat. And so Tim McKelvey went on to analyze this and he just realized that the innovation stack is about how um, companies that are uniquely focused on one thing will basically produce so many thousands of little things for their end consumers, all the culture is going to, all the culture, all the focus is going to translate into a kind of intangible mode that end consumers can feel. They can feel the focus that's being placed on solving their problems, and then they will stick around. So that's what happened to Square. And it's actually a theory that I find is um, very applicable to companies in the digital space. Because in the digital space, switching from one um, solution to the other as a user has a marginal cost close to zero. So if you think about why you choose an app versus another, when you go to the app store, it costs the same to click on one app versus the other. So you tend to gravitate to the one that's marginally better. And in the aggregate, that turns into exponential differences in traffic. So when you see a company like Spotify magically outpacing competitors, when you see a company like Palantir to beat Microsoft, to, um, to Skywise, even though Microsoft started a year earlier. That's kind of the magical, intangible force that's acting in the background. And when you look at a company like BlackBerry, two things happen. It's, I think the innovation stack is there for sure because that's all they do. They do endpoint protection and real-time operating systems. But two, the fact that John Chen or someone in there, together with John Chen, had this incredible vision of understanding where industry was heading back when, when John, Chen, John Chen took the reins of this company. It, it took me a while to understand what they were heading towards when I first saw the company. But these guys were on this eight years ago, which is incredible. And one thing that I find that people forget very often is when you see companies like Nvidia and Tesla and you see their stock price today, the stock of these companies was trading sideways for more than 10 years, which is incredible. I mean, the line looks excruciatingly flat for, uh, I think, um, a, um, a time period longer than, than most people can hold on for. And BlackBerry is kind of the same story. The, um, the stock has been trading sideways since John Chen came on board, and they've been very patiently building moats um, to position themselves very strongly in this future that I think, I think is going to happen. So, you know, I think it's incredible. And I wouldn't like it if I didn't see signs of this very good execution. And I think that just to, to, to kind of summarize this for, for the audience, the way that they've inserted this Trojan horse into the auto industry silently over the last almost decade, I think to me is indicative of world-class management. And then again, it's the attitude that we tend to see in other kind of revolutionary CEOs and stuff that kind of further makes it for me. You know, I think previously with more traditional kind of businesses, you would be like, well, they just bought a boat. And now they're operating the boat and the boat is making this much more cash flow. So the stock will kind of tick up a little bit and so forth. Now, none of this happens. I think when you deal with intangibles and software, um, you get a lot more of the winner takes all kind of mentality uh, slash competitive dynamics. And it just takes such a while 
for that to manifest in terms of financials. But then once it does, it scales very quickly, which is what we're seeing with a lot of these mega stocks today, which are funnily enough, also inducing more short-term thinking into the market because everyone's like, I just want to catch the next Tesla and I want to do it this year. Right. This, they is, want it this is the year. This is the year that I'm going to get rich and I'm going to catch the next Tesla. And, and you may well do so, but probably the next Tesla is brewing and it's going to take years and years of just slowly watching the qualitative unfold. What would you say are your, uh, like your big bets on the company? What, what do you need to see happen to really reassure or take, or take your convictions to the next level? Are you looking for certain signs, um, maybe of like growth or, or acquisitions um, that will kind of reinstill that? So one thing that I think the market is going to reward the company for uh, in the short term is increased sales in cybersecurity. So as soon as we see them selling more and better in the cybersecurity space, the market's going to be like, well, now I understand the company. And then it's going gonna, it's gonna to happily price in the auto mode and so forth. But it needs to see that the company is growing its top line. And if you look at, for instance, CrowdStrike's price to sales ratio, it's 3316 as of now, and Blackberries is 5.13. The revenue is actually pretty similar. The difference is one is growing and the other is not. So Wall Street doesn't like stagnant businesses. When it sees that Blackberry is not stagnant, hopefully, because we don't know if it's going to happen for sure or not, then I think it will happily assign the stock more multiples, uh, higher multiples. And then the second factor is Blackberry Ivy getting released, which I think is going to happen at some point in the next 12 months, if I'm not mistaken. I think once we see OEMs running BlackBerry Ivy, so having their cars connected to um, the BlackBerry Ivy system and then have the system return insights to drivers that help them save money and time and that somehow translate into a subscription revenue for OEMs, I think the market is going to price that in um, quite enthusiastically. So for me, when I see um, BlackBerry trading at 3 point whatever billion today, 3.7, I believe it is, this asset is probably worth more. So it looks asymmetric to me in that sense.